chair of the uh, of the ANSCO department formerly, and now the president of the Afghan Studies Association. Unfortunately, we couldn't be here tonight to uh, introduce our special guest, Frederick Schiebert. But it's my um, it's my special pleasure, as a result, to be able to try and fill Tom's shoes and do that. And I'm very happy to have that pleasure. Our guest is um, is a graduate of that other institution, you know, the one across the river, the one I always refer to as <coughs> the best university in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, he's a, uh, uh, he's a uh, graduate of uh, Harvard, where he did his MA and his PhD, and previously uh, studied for his uh, BA degree at the University of Michigan, if I remember correctly. Uh, has very good uh, language credentials, he's fluent in Russian and French and Arabic, and I think your Dari is pretty good. The, the dialect of Persian is spoken in Afghanistan. Uh, and of course, he comes to us as an archaeologist. He's the, uh, the staff ar ar archaeologist, uh, or the archaeological fellow, is it, at the National Geographic Society. And tonight he's going to uh, share with us some of the, uh, the secrets and the backstory of the national treasures of Afghanistan. I think there are a number of layers of possible discussion here. The content of that wonderful collection, which some of you have seen uh, in exhibit form, uh, and also the story about how it was preserved uh, over the course of two decades, during horrendous decades of civil war and, uh, and invasion, and so on, has really been saved for uh, for the benefit of all of us, and not least for the benefit of Afghan national uh, culture. So it gives me great pleasure to turn the floor over to our guest, Dr. Frederick Hubert, uh, who's come to uh, spend the next hour or so with us. And then after the presentation, there will be an informal reception in the next room. So I hope many of you will be able to join us uh, for that and uh, have a chance to continue the discussion informally. So please join me in welcoming our, our guest. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction and welcome this evening. It's a great pleasure to be here at Boston University. Uh, I just sent a message to Tom Barfield saying that the view from this side of the river is so much better than the <laughs> other side. And I want to tell you, it's a blessing. I mean, the weather is gorgeous. It's just a true pleasure to be back here in Boston. And I, it's been a while, and I must tell you that uh, it's, it is wonderful to be here. And uh, to be here to tell you about, uh, I think, an incredible story. An incredible story of uh, heroism on the part of modern Afghanistan's Afghans, and uh, a story of wonderful cultural heritage in a part of the world that very few people realize is as complex and really interesting as it is. So it is true that I work for National Geographic, so I must start with a map, and I start with a map. It shows you uh, Afghanistan in the center of this very, very interesting area, which makes the news today. Uh, its neighbors include Pakistan, India, China, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, and Iran. You keep those in mind. Right? It's landlocked, but it is at the very heart of the Silk Road. It is at the very heart of that route from east to west and north and south that made trade possible, despite its being landlocked. It is because it's a conduit between mountains. The passes that go through Afghanistan lead from valley to valley, which allow for trade and has allowed for trade to go east and west and north and south for literally thousands of years. And the trade ended in these wonderful places such as this. This is Herat, one of the great cities on the edge of the mountains, on the edge of the deserts, 
It's a city which has a caravanserai. It's a place for trade caravans to come and stop, refuel, and this is really what made Afghanistan at the very heart of the Silk Road, at the heart of this trade, at the heart of this uh, system of exchange across Asia, east and west and north and south. This is the way archaeologists think about the map, right? We ignore the political boundaries. We, we look at the map and we say, ah, oh, this is the way the world really is, right? We look at China and India and Iran and Egypt and we say they're all interconnected. And when you look at a system like that, this is the way anthropologists and archaeologists think. We think, how did this system of trade work? thousands of years ago. And if you want to study that, you want to go right to the center, right to the center, which is over there. <laughs> right at the heart, which is Afghanistan. And so that's what inspired me. It, it took me to Harvard, it took me, you know, I thought, wow, I'm going to go look at these ancient Silk Road sites. And it was absolutely impossible. Because you imagine, I started my career in the 1980s when Afghanistan and the Soviet Union were closed. But we knew a lot about it. We knew about these fantastic cultures. This was perhaps the most famous structure in all of Central Asia, the giant Buddhas of Bamiyan. These structures, which were not only a beacon for religion, but for trade. They stood so tall, traders could see them from far away. And you can see at the bottom there are some French archaeologists for scale. Not that the French archaeologists are so small, it's the Buddhists are big. But there were other French archaeologists who were huge in their own right. This is one of my favorites, a guy named Joseph Hacan, who went there in the 1920s and the 1930s, and he discovered in Afghanistan what would become one of the world's greatest archaeological finds. He dug underneath this tent and he excavated right before World War II. He found these amazing finds of silk and ivory and bronze that belonged to the Silk Road 2,000 years ago. Here's what he had in his hand. It's a water goddess, a, a giant, literally giant, more than two feet long piece of ivory carved in an Indian goddess. And he found it in Afghanistan at a site called Bagram. He found it in a room that we call a warehouse. We think that this room, actually there were two rooms that were found in Bagram, Afghanistan, were intact 2,000 years ago. And the merchant who put all the artifacts, and, and this is a drawing of all the artifacts in that room, as they were specifically put by that merchant 2,000 years ago, and he became worried about what, happened, what was going on there, just, just as we do in Afghanistan today, right? And he bricked up the walls. He bricked up that door or there and another one up there and went away hoping to come back and he never did. Lucky for us archaeologists because in the 1920s, Joseph Hakan came back and excavated this very same room and found an intact merchant's warehouse from 2,000 years ago. And here's his excavations. He found these incredible ivory thrones that were in this warehouse. Bronzes, ivories. It was an amazing array of objects that were found. This was as important as King Tutankhamun's tomb. Check the back of the... There it goes. Are we back? We're back. All right. Archaeologists can't speak without pictures, okay, so... So I want to show you one of these. Yeah, yeah. There. Oh. Oop. There. There, it's back. All right, so let's give this a try. Whoop. Oh, uh, this should rotate. This is a lovely picture of a throne 
well, it's not going to do what we want. <laughs> but I assure you that in the 1920s and 1930s, they found a series of 12 thrones in this warehouse that astonished the world, made headline news. It was amazing to see what was being traveling along the Silk Road 2,000 years ago. First time. Well, you know, I want to tell you a little bit more about Afghanistan. Um, Afghanistan had all these treasures that were to be discovered by archaeologists. And one of the best archaeologists in Afghanistan was none other than uh, King Zahir Shah of Afghanistan, who ruled there in the 1950s and 1960s. A wonderful man, very educated. I, I have a very memorable picture of King Zahir Shah on my desk in which he was sitting with a pile of National Geographics, and apparently he said, Everything you learned about history, you learned from National Geographic. <laughs> well, I don't buy that. But he himself discovered something that we all thought was undiscoverable in Afghanistan. Because for a hundred years, we had heard that Alexander the Great and his armies had marched to Afghanistan. There were coins, there were random finds from, from Alexander the Great in Afghanistan but nobody had ever found any tangible remains until Zahir Shah went on a hunting trip in 1964 and there he found this. Can you see it? Okay. He found the capital of a large building cut in a Greek style and he realized that this was something very special. He invited French archaeologists Paul Bernard, a very good friend of ours in the archaeological world, French archaeologists to come and excavate. And what did they find at the site? But in an entire city, a Greek colony that was founded by Alexander the Great on the border of Afghanistan and the world to the north, the nomads to the north. And here in this photo, you see the ramparts. Those aren't sand dunes. Those are big columns, big, big um, towers that were at the edge of the city, and you were looking down onto the city, and you see uh, buildings in a Greek colony that was founded in the third century BC. Literally, a, a world astonishing find here in Afghanistan. Here's one of the buildings. It's a temple. Uh, it's a very strange temple because it has Greek uh, sculpture in it, but the temple itself was very Eastern looking. So as they excavated and investigated the city, they found that Greeks and the locals, who are called Bactrians, started living together and creating what is called the Greco-Bactrian Kingdom, Greco-Bactrian Empire, which was very important in this area. First tangible evidence of the Alexander the Great's presence in Central Asia it was truly astonishing. Here's just a little idea of the architecture there. Everything that the Greco-Bactrians did was huge. If the Greeks had gymnasiums for exercise and for education, the Greco-Bactrians did it five times bigger. And here you see one of the buildings. They had theaters that were bigger than those that were in Greece themselves. It's quite astonishing. And here, on the very eastern edge of the Hellenistic world in Afghanistan, well, I want to move, because we have a lot of turf to cover in this particular talk, I want to move on to the third, perhaps most amazing discovery that was made in Afghanistan, really putting the ancient cultures of Afghanistan on the, the world's headlines. Here we have a bunch of Afghans who are looking on some investigations in 1978, just at the very time that the Soviet invasion was happening, just at the very time that social chaos was happening in Afghanistan. These Afghans are looking on something really incredible. What are they looking at? They're looking at a series of six golden intact burials from 2,000 years ago that were excavated by a Soviet archaeologist, by a Russian archaeologist named Viktor Sainidi. Six burials that were found intact in Afghanistan from 2000 BC. Uh, sorry, 2,000 years ago. Um, the first time that we had a chance to see what was really at the heart of the Silk Road at that time, just at the time of Rome, just at the time of Han Chinese 
And yet, in Afghanistan, we had no idea. But here, we were seeing a series of five princesses and one prince who were living right at the heart of Afghanistan. These excavations were carried out under very difficult conditions by a Russian archaeologist named Viktor Sarnidi. He worked through the winter of 1978 into the spring of 1979. His fingers were numb. He ran out of food, he told me. And they, they excavated more than 21,000 pieces of gold from this excavation. It was amazing. For an archaeologist in Central Asia, this should have been the top of their career. But Victor knew that war was happening. War was impending in Afghanistan. So he quickly had to put everything in paper bags. He took it on a bus and he took it down to, Af to the capital of Afghanistan, to Kabul. He took all these treasures, these gold bowls. Look, there's a, a golden belt, a golden necklace, incredible finds. And he took them down to Kabul and he had to do a very quick inventory. He counted every piece and he put them in safes in the museum in Afghanistan and he went back, he went away. He never had a chance to see these objects until mid-80s. We didn't know what happened to this. Can you imagine an archaeological find like that? 21,000 pieces of gold from the Seneca Silk Road that would, uh, would shed a new light on the archaeology of the Silk Road. He never had a chance to see them, to publish them, to exhibit them. And then in the 1990s, the Kabul Museum was bombed. It was destroyed. Civil war took a very bad turn in the early 1990s. The museum was taken over as a militia headquarters and one of seven different fighting militias. And they were fighting. And just like in any war, the militia headquarters were destroyed. Here is the Kabul Museum. The museum people would come back, try and pick up pieces of what was in that Kabul Museum. It was terrible. The museum lost its roof. It lost its windows. It lost its inventory sheets. Everything was destroyed. It was a terrible tragedy, not only for Afghanistan, but for the world. If you can imagine this museum that had the treasures of Alexander the Great, of the merchant's warehouse from Bagram, and of this site called the Batring Gold or Tilatape, it's destroyed. We all cried. People here at BU, in Boston, around the world, wrote articles to Archaeology Magazine and said, this is a world tragedy. This is terrible. All the artifacts of the Kabul Museum are either destroyed, looted, or melted down. It was really a terrible situation. It wasn't just bad for the museum. It was bad for the archaeological sites of Afghanistan itself. Here's Alexander City, excavated by the French, excavated by Paul Bernard. See those beautiful structures? Look what happens in war. The city is looted. Those mole holes that you see there are looters' pets. You know, when you're in a situation of war, when there's no political control, when there's chaos everywhere, there's no other option. And people come in and simply loot and ransack these sites looking for objects of value. This is the situation in Afghanistan. It's really terrible. The museum was destroyed. The sites are looted. I had a personal connection to this story. Uh, I did my graduate work, actually, with Victor Sarinidi. I was sent, it's true, I was at that place across the river. But I did most of my research with a wonderful guy named Victor Sarinidi who had excavated the Bactrian gold. And I went, I didn't have a chance to go to Afghanistan, but I went just across the border in Turkmenistan where he was still digging. And I remember him telling us about these treasures that he found in the 1970s. I said, Victor, that is an amazing story. You have to tell that to the world. So when I 
finally came back from my PhD research in Turkmenistan in 1989, quite a while ago. Uh, I took it to National Geographic, and the editor said, yes, we must do an article about this. And I remember this article very well. It was published in March of 1990, called The Golden Horde of Bactria. And I had the honor, I was still a graduate student at that time, to be the translator of this article. Victor was sitting there, the editor was sitting nearby, and I was going back and forth. And if you've ever been in a situation like that, you know there's a lot of food and a lot of wine. And I starved because I was just talking back and forth between these two. That's okay. It was an incredible article and an incredible thing. And the last line of this article, I will never forget. Victor said, look well on these photos because the artifacts are gone. And that's the way it was from 1990 through, you know, early 1990, mid-1990. 2000 came along, you know, 2001, we had this terrible situation. The Taliban who had come in to sort of help make peace after the Soviets left became corrupt. And they were infiltrated by Islamic fundamentalists who thought that the cultural heritage of Afghanistan wasn't worth anything. And in 2001, they made a decree that the whole world heard, and I'm sure you all remember this. They said, we must destroy the giant Buddhas of Bamiyan, and we must destroy all of the graven images of humans in the museums. It was a terrible moment, and they did that. And it was a second tragedy to Afghanistan. We brought Victor to the US after that, and we said, where are the artifacts from the museum? And Victor said, they must be lost Stolen, certainly the gold of Bactria has melted down. Well, fast forward a little bit to an interesting moment in 2003. I was actually working on a project in the Black Sea. We called it the Black Sea Trade Project. A colleague of mine, Alex Gantos, who's here with us. And we were doing a great project looking at seafaring. And I came back from that project, and about a week later, in August of 2003, I was in the kitchen doing dishes, or I don't know what I was doing, but I heard a report on BBC. And the report said, well, you know, the newly appointed president, not elected at that point, the newly appointed president, Hamid Karzai, is snooping around his presidential palace, and he has gone into the bank vault and found that it was intact in the presidential palace. And in this bank vault, there's also a series of museum boxes. Now, I think for most of the world, they were very interested to hear that Hamid Karzai was finding that the bank vault was intact. But I heard that museum boxes were intact. And I thought, oh my goodness. And I called Victor in Moscow. And I said, Victor, do you think those boxes could be the Bactrian gold? Do you think that could be the treasure that you had found? We hadn't seen these objects on the market, right? The museum was destroyed. There were a lot of objects that had been circulating. We had these published articles in Archaeology Magazine saying lost, stolen, gone, right? But we hadn't seen the Bactrian gold. I thought, wow, could it actually have been hidden and saved? Uh, well, he was on his way back to Turkmenistan, and he said, you know, I can't really deal with this right now. I'm good for he said, you figure it out. So I got in touch with National Geographic and I said, would you guys be interested in writing a little paragraph about um, the Bactrian gold as you know, a follow-up to that 1990 article? Those of you who have National Geographic in your garage or in your attic, you know that they never really go out of date. So an article written in 1990 that was like dot, 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 they could still be finished. And uh, so they sent me there. And here's my picture. This is Kabul in 2003. Pretty burned out place. There's no electricity. There's no running water. It's a city of 500,000 people that had burgeoned to 5 million people as refugees were coming back. That was the place where we were going to go look to see if the museum treasures were still intact. I went and I saw this guy. This is Omar Khan Masudi. He's now one of my great heroes. He's the director of the National Museum. And at that point, I was a little worried. 
I went in for this meeting and I said to Mr. Masudi, I, I said, I heard that museum boxes were safe in the presidential bank vault. I said, is that possibly true? Could it be the Bactrian gold? I had my little notebook there. And he said, ah, Fred, you know, it's true. There are some museum boxes in the presidential bank vault. But, you know, uh, the boxes are locked and we've lost the keys and all the inventory data sheets are, are lost. We don't know what's inside, so that's it. And I thought, <clears throat> that's a good way how to get rid of a American archaeologist, right? To sort of like tell him to go away. And I put on my biggest doggy eyes and I thought, oh, too bad. And I walked out. By the way, Tom Barfield was with me on that trip, and I really have to do a shout out to him to thank him for taking me. I was extremely nervous about going to Kabul for that time. And uh, Mr. Masudi turned to Tom and myself, and he said, Listen, don't go away. He said, You know, you're a museum curator. If you promise to do a scientific inventory of these crates, we'll open them up for you. Well, with an offer like that, I, I didn't know quite what to do. Uh, at least I, I went back to National Geographic and I said, look, I, I know you guys fund science, but I don't think you would fund a, a research project in the basement of a bank vault in Kabul, but they said they would. So with that, and with the help of the National Endowment for Humanities, we put together an inventory group. And I'm going to show you a little bit about this. So NEH, National Endowment for Humanities, does inventory here in the U.S., but they do a few projects outside. They said, you have to do everything very scientifically. You've got to find every picture of any known object in Afghanistan from the museum and put it on a database. So this is what we did. And then you have to have a way to do the inventory where there's no electricity or water or anything like that. So we got Hewlett Packard to get us little mobile printers that would allow us to print. And we did inventory sheets in English and in the local language in Dari. And we were so excited about this. We got it all ready and every day during the end of 2003, 2004, I would call Kabul and say, are you ready? We're ready to go. We're ready to go. And finally they said, all right, you should come to Kabul. So I got big cheese from National Geographic and I said, let's go, we're about to open up the vault in Afghanistan. And we went, and there we are, <laughs> waiting. <laughs> yeah, because guess what? Mr. Masudi was not joking. The boxes were locked and the keys were lost. Because they have a different system of museum curation in, Afg in Afghanistan that we do here. In Afghanistan, they have key holders. They don't have curators. So these guys who keep the treasures of the museum had the keys and they were gone. You have to imagine, this is 25 years after these things had been last seen. And where were the key holders? They were gone. Apparently the Afghans had put messages in the newspaper on television saying, key holders come back. They never came back. We had to get the Attorney General of Afghanistan to step in for one of these key holders in this place because it's an inherited position. You can't just like get a key. Um, and we did that. And as we were waiting, we assembled this, I think, pretty amazing group of Afghans. We had, this is by the way, in the secret bank vault. You get to see the, the vault there. And uh, we got about 18 Afghan museum people and we all had different jobs. We we're gonna have somebody who take the object out of the box there's the uh, Attorney General, by the way, gray haired man in the suit. And uh, next to him, or, or a little bit uh, uh, to his right, is Carla Grissman, who was my compatriot in this particular project. Because Mr. Masudi said, Fred, only one foreigner can be in the inventory room. Well, he said two, actually. He said you and this volunteer that we had at the Kabul Museum in the 1970s. Well, you can do your own calculations on whole, how old she is, right? But I found her in extreme retirement in London, and I went to London and I asked Carla, I said, would you be willing to come to Kabul and inventory some objects that are in the basement of a bank vault, basically uh, 12 hours a day, seven days a week until we're done? And she said, yes. 
and she has been our partner in this uh, inventory throughout the whole time, believe me, she's just fantastic. And she remembered every object that was in those crates. Well, we're finally getting to that moment when we had to get to opening the crates, and there was no key, right? So we didn't know quite what to do. Uh, the best thing that we did was we brought Victor Sarnidi in from Turkmenistan. We flew him from Turkmenistan to Baku, down to Afghanistan. There he is, the white-haired man with the mustache in the middle. He's looking a little incredulous, and holding his hands on the, uh, on the safe itself is the Minister of Culture. And in the back, you see me with this very sort of uh, scared expression on my face. I'm looking, they're using a circular saw to open up this this safe, right? It's a, a steel safe. Um, steel on steel means a lot of heat. And I'm thinking, okay, we have two choices, right? Either there's going to be a puddle of ancient gold at the bottom of the safe, or there's going to be a note from the Taliban saying, ha, we got there first. <laughs> but that's not what happened. There it was. When we opened that safe, there was the factory in gold. Or at least that's what we thought. Incredible. Dozens and dozens of apple case that had adorned nomads from 2,000 years ago. We looked at these pieces, and some of the artistry of these pieces was so incredible that it didn't look like it would come from Afghanistan. I mean, these two cherubs would have been at home in Pompeii or Rome. And in fact, as I looked around in this room, this inventory room, with two foreigners and 20 or 30 Afghans, including the security guards, we had a lot of people in that room, I, I saw that they were still doubtful of what was going on. They had never seen this treasure before, right? None of them had seen it. Maybe Carla had seen it, or Victor had seen it, but none of them, how did they know this was the actual Bactrian gold? Well, this was a big problem. So finally, as we were going through these pieces, here is a very memorable picture for me because the Minister of Culture is holding an applique, holding a florette from one of the burials, and Victor spied it, and his eyes got wide, and he said, ah, he said, let me look at that. He said, there's a little nylon piece in this piece of jewelry that I tied on myself where there was a break. He said, I can guarantee that this is the actual Bactrian gold. These are the actual treasures of the National Museum of Afghanistan. And it was at that point that I saw this veil of disbelief fall from the eyes of the Afghans in the room when they finally realized that they themselves, the Afghans, had saved their national heritage of Afghanistan after more than 25 years. It was an amazing moment. It was incredible to think that they, these people, were the heroes who had brought all this stuff. And you know, it was also an amazing moment because at that point, Victor kind of backed off and he pulled me away and he said, hey Fred, you know, there are 21,000 pieces of gold here and you're going to have to count them all. He said, I, I don't want to do that. I want to go back to Turkmenistan. Uh, he said, it's your project now, right? <laughs> And I thought, oh my god, okay. But before he left, Victor gave us a gift, which is something, if you have a chance to go to the Met before September 20th, and you see this wonderful display of artifacts, you'll see the results of what he gave us. He gave us the original field documents. These are the drawings that he made when he was excavating these artifacts. Six beautiful drawings of these barrows that allow us to reconstruct what these nomads would have looked like 2,000 years ago. Really, it's the first time that we have an idea of who was at the very center of the Silk Road at that time. It's really cool. Now, I'm going to show you a few of these artifacts because, of course, I want you all to go up to New York uh, in this next week and take a look at these artifacts. So I'm just going to show you a few. Um, here's one, for example. We call it the Bactri and Aphrodite. Very beautiful piece. These next few pictures are all from one burial. Uh, very classical with this sort of voluptuous uh, Nike robe and you know the, the winged um, it, it, it's a cherub in a way except look at the forehead it has an Indian beauty mark on it it's a mix of East and West on the same artifact very interesting 
No, we, we knew that they were nomads. They were all wearing, again, from burial number six, the first burial that we excavated, we found these, these very dense anklets, solid gold. We looked at them and thought, wow, you know, this is a lot of gold. Each individual was wearing almost 20 pounds of gold. Well, what this is, is the nomadic banking system. You know, nomads don't have houses, so they don't have banks. They are wearing this. This is not like Tut's tomb, right? This is not like an Egyptian burial where all the great goods are given after the, the, the person has, has died and, and for the afterlife. These are objects that they wore during daily life. And we saw an amazing array of artistic styles. And look, it's the gold of Afghanistan. And as we went through these objects, we saw a certain similarity in the gold. It, it didn't vary much in its color. So we started to think, maybe it's all from one source. And these objects all have stones. And most of these stones, the light blue stones, the light bluish green stones, are turquoise that end up being local. So it's local gold and local turquoise, even though it's using all these different art styles. What's the red stone? I'm red sorry? Stone, the red stone. The red stone, garnet. We have garnet and um, turquoise. And we just did a, a very interesting uh, symposium at the Met, I'm sorry that you didn't have a chance to say, where we discussed the lack of uh, lapis lazuli, because one of the most famous stones of Afghanistan is lapis. For some reason, the nomads didn't like dark blue. They were very color specific. They liked turquoise, they liked red, and they ignored the local stone that was exported all the way to Egypt. Um, but they did some things that we, we thought were quite amazing. This necklace, one of four necklaces from this particular group of uh, uh, burials, wonderful, um, has beautiful gold work. And we do think it's local. It's, it's called granulation, where they take gold and, and they toss it into a bucket and it um, falls into tiny, tiny little balls. And then you can take those little beads and glue them on. It's incredibly laborious. And take a look at the decor, the florets on the inside. They're all heart-shaped. We've all been fascinated by the number of hearts that are in the art. And now we found that it's a local Central Asian design, not European, um, but, but local Central Asian that goes back into uh, 2000 BC. Here's my favorite piece from burial number six. It's the crown, no matter crown. I guess it's favorite because of the story. Um, but it was the biggest piece of jewelry. I mean, it's a crown. I mean, can you imagine a crown from a nomadic princess? Um, when Victor found this, this was, think of it, he excavated the burials by number one, two, three, four, five, six. So it was the last burial that he excavated in the middle of February. It was freezing cold, and he found this beautiful crown, and he put it in the tent where they put all the good finds. And his hands were numb, and he went out, and he went back, and the crown was gone. Uh-oh. How do you lose a crown, right? Uh, well, it turns out he didn't lose the crown. This is a true nomadic crown. It's um, uh, collapsible. You can take the five tree ornaments off of the top and take the band and fold it up and put it in a little pouch. Can you imagine that nomadic princess who was riding across the plains of Afghanistan and would find a nice spot and put a crown on? Pretty nice life, I would have to say. Well, we inventoried this. We found about 1,200 objects from burial number six. We were exhausted after that. We knew that we had five more burials. Here we are. All the Afghans start smoking, if you can imagine this, in the basement of a bank vault with no ventilation. Yeah. Right, we have 19,000 more objects to go. <laughs> so I'm not gonna show you 19,000 more objects, but I'm gonna show you a few. So I'll pick the best, because I like this guy. He's the, the, the prince um, who stood more than six feet tall, had you know a really great sword and all these knives and great stuff like that. Um, he had these boot buckles that I just adored. I love these boot buckles because I remember them from the 1990 article. I looked at them in that article from the photographs and I said, wow, these must be Chinese. Look at what they depict. They're mirror images of each other. It's a chariot with sort of a Chinese looking guy riding in it and a parasol on top and two dragons pulling it. 
But, you know, after going through all that gold that we had already looked at, we realized it's the same local gold. It's the same turquoise. This is being locally made. They're pulling imagery all the way from China and creating it in Afghanistan. I love this particular knife and its sheath. Uh, I keep saying it's my favorite piece, but um, then I have 1,200 other pieces that are my favorite as well. But I'll just show you a little bit about it. I, lo I love it in particular, this pommel on the top of the sheath. It, it's a bear, a sort of a Siberian bear. It reminds me of Victor, who excavated it. Again, a Siberian motif, Siberian, Chinese, sort of like that dancing bear. And yet, it's the same local gold and the same local turquoise. Very interesting, indeed. In the end, we had a, an amazing good news story to tell. We worked for three and a half months. We inventoried every single 21,000 pieces of gold that Victor had found. We were able to reconstruct what they looked like. We did an article for Geographic. Um, but the good news is that every single piece of gold that Victor had inventoried in 1979 was found. That's an amazing story. I really had never, ever expected that, given the war and chaos of Afghanistan. You know, we invited Hamid Karzai to see the treasure. We put a big mound of gold out there. I love this photo because Hamid is looking at uh, the inventory data sheets and not at the gold. <laughs> he said, excellent inventory. This is very good. And, uh, you know, you can imagine how tired we were after doing this. And uh, we put everything in these safes, and that's what's left on, on top of the safes. That's what's left of the mobile inventory lab for National, from National Endowment for Humanities. It was like basically nothing. And I was homesick. I had a one-way ticket from the U.S. to Afghanistan. I was like, okay, yes, I can go home now. I've finished my job. And Mr. Masudi said, oh, no, you can't. I said, why? He said, there are more boxes. Oh, okay. I thought, well, that's interesting. I mean, the, the museum is destroyed. The Taliban came through. What could it possibly be? And plus, I had to go back. I had to get more money. So I went back to Geographic. I went back to NEH, got more funding. And I came back. And uh, thanks to Mr. Masudi, he said, I tell you what, Fred, I'll make your life a lot easier. We won't have to use the circular saw for the next one. He said, I got this guy who can open up the crates without a circular saw. And I don't know where he got them, maybe from the Kabul jail or something like that. But this guy basically opened up the safes in five minutes, and he is actually using a bent nail, right? I gave him five bucks, and I said, oh, to the studio, I said, please take him back to where he went, right? Because I knew that security was not enough with those old crates, so we were very pleased to be doing this inventory. But the next objects that came out just amazed me. I really couldn't believe it. Because I could understand the Afghan Satan gold, but what we had here was the ivories from Begram, from that merchant's warehouse from 2,000 years ago that the French had excavated in the 1930s. You know, the museum was destroyed. This is a two-foot-tall water goddess. It's on display at the Met right now. So beautiful, so delicate, and it was intact there. Now remember, the crates didn't have any inventory sheets with us. Every single Afghan around me was amazed to see what was coming out of these crates. You know, the ivories that decorated those thrones that we showed you from Bagram, they were all intact. There were other objects from Bagram. All of the masterpieces from Bagram were there. There were these plaster medallions that had decorated the walls of the palace of the Kushan kings. There were these extremely fragile glass items. Uh, I'm a field archaeologist. I have never in my life excavated an intact piece of glass. But here, from these boxes that were wrapped, and believe me, you if you knew what these things were wrapped in, old pink toilet paper and newspaper, they were coming out. We had these intact pieces of glass from Beckham. It was astonishing. They literally shouldn't have existed, and we didn't understand it. You know, here's a, a glass 
goblet, which we know came from Alexandria, Egypt. It probably went by sea all the way to India, and from India up to Begum, and it was on its way to a trade des destination. Couldn't understand. Box after box we opened them. Finally, when we got to these fish vials, beautiful, beautiful um, uh, vials that probably held perfume or, or wine, uh, finally it dawned on me what was going on. I couldn't believe that I hadn't figured it out by then. Finally I realized that some brilliant person in Afghanistan, before the museum was destroyed, realized that it was dangerous there and in secret had ordered the museum to have all of its masterpieces taken off display and hidden. That's what we were opening up. And when we were done with this inventory, we inventoried another 40 or 50 crates of materials, we realized that 95% of the masterpieces from the Kabul Museum, from that destroyed hulk that you saw, had actually been hidden and saved. Wow, that was amazing. And you know, even more amazing was the fact that there were 30 people who had been involved in crating up all those artifacts, who during those 25 years had never said anything about these. If you can imagine that, you know? For one person to know a secret, that's something for 25 years. For 30 people to know a secret for 30 years, that's simply amazing. Um, but that's the story that the treasures of the Cabo Museum are safe. And, uh, we finished this inventory, well, it's the same story. Out of money, out of supplies, homesick guy, right? And Masudi said, you can't go home, there's more. And so I did, because I knew it was important. And uh, this third inventory that, I, that we did, I think it was almost the most amazing, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, our third inventory was not done in the Presidential Palace, it was done in other places in Kabul, in places uh, secreted away, and uh, the story of this third inventory is one that has to do with the history of Afghanistan. As I mentioned, in 2001, uh, Mullah Omar, influenced by outsiders, decreed that all human sculpture should be destroyed. The giant Buddhists of Bamiyan were destroyed. Guys from the culture police, so they called them, went into the Kabul Museum with axes and hammers and smashed sculpture. So what I saw in this third inventory just blew my socks off. There in the crates, in these other places, were the best pieces of sculpture from the Kabul Museum. The museum personnel had put sort of B-grade sculpture on the top of these crates, and the Taliban had gone and smashed that. And the museum personnel risked their lives. They didn't tell them that the good stuff's underneath. But there you go. There you see. You know, people like this, Mir Ghulam Nabi, who's one of our heroes from the Kabul Museum, he risked his life. He saved these things. He didn't tell them that the good stuff is underneath. And what treasures it is. These coins were saved. Of the 40,000 coins of the Kabul Museum, only 2,000 are saved, but the very best ones are. These are basically a portrait gallery of the ancient kings of Afghanistan, saved for humanity and saved for the people of Afghanistan. Here's a beautiful bodhisattva from 1,500 years ago, from 1,000 years ago, that is as bright today as it was when it came out of the ground. It simply is amazing that it's preserved. And it was also wrapped in pink toilet paper. And these Bud early Buddhist sculptures, I like them almost the best, from sites such as Hara and Fundukistan. I like them the best because they are early examples of Buddhist art, but they're also naturalistic. When Afghans look at these, they see actual faces of Afghans from that time. It's, it's true national art. I just think it's wonderful. And I'll end with this slide, which is a life-size Buddha. This is uh, my photo, just from the moment that it was uh, taken out of its crate. You can see all the paper and the newspaper and everything that's around it. And I lo like this picture very much because it shows this sort of sleeping Buddha. Um, and I imagine it was in these crates for the last 25 years, just sleeping, knowing that one day we would open up these crates and that the world would be able to see Afghan art once again. So I hope that you have a chance 
to see the exhibition before it closes in New York. And I'm happy to say that it will open, it will continue, it will open in Ottawa, in Canada, uh, on October 23rd of this year, and it will continue its tour. Thank you very much. The question is, um, has there been any efforts in recovering other objects that have been pilfered or lost from Afghanistan? It, it's, two, two, the, the, it's actually a double question. The first is that obviously we're always looking for objects from the museum itself. Um, the storerooms, which don't represent the masterpieces, that, are, that 95% that I was telling you about, you know, oh, a great deal of the storeroom objects were lost, and those have Kabul Museum numbers, and we work with uh, a number of international agencies to bring them back. But even more so, and uh, I think this is of the greatest interest, um, both here at Boston University and for the AIA and for other people who are interested in uh, heritage, cultural heritage, is the very porous borders of Afghanistan. We really don't have any ability to control the uh, looting of archaeological sites in Afghanistan. And for me, this is the real tragedy, because this is like the rape of the country. You can imagine a country that's been in, had war for 25 years, it's just starting to get on its feet now, and people want to go back, they want to be proud, and they see all of their artifacts just being taken out of the country. It's terrible. It's a terrible feeling there. There's a sense of loss and hopelessness with that. So our number one goal is to try and keep the objects from the archaeological sites in Afghanistan at those sites. And that means education in the country, education of border guards, and education of people around the world to please not, you know, purchase artifacts from Afghanistan. It's the best thing that we can do to help stabilize and help create a sense of identity in Afghanistan. And to follow up, but what's the status of the museum at this point? The status of the museum right now is a step-by-step -step recovery. I'm happy to say that the museum has a roof, it has windows, it has electricity. Um, we're not in a, a position to open up the museum for these sort of golden national treasures. Um, but we keep the exhibition on tour abroad primarily to have a message to the world about Afghanistan's importance in these trade routes and how Afghanistan was important in the past and it's important in the, in, in the present. And we use that as a way to help bring education to the museum. So every time we have the exhibition in a different venue, we're doing training for the museum personnel. Can you imagine? the lack of training over 25 years. So those are our objectives, and we look forward to bringing these treasures back to Afghanistan. So when you're saying that you're doing these, uh, these traveling expeditions, are you literally bringing all these artifacts from place to place to place? Yeah, the question is, uh, is the exhibition traveling? And uh, yes, indeed, it travels. And um, I, I want to thank you for that question, because many people think that it's safer for the uh, National Treasures of Afghanistan to be at the mat or be at the National Gallery. But um, as a museum curator, I want to tell you, it's a risk. Those objects, when they travel, when they go on an airplane or on a, you know, that's a risk. That is something that the Afghans themselves, the parliament, has made an agreement for, for their National Treasures to go abroad, because everybody knows it's important to tell the world about this area. And, um, of course, we watch very carefully every time we have the artifacts on exhibit. But they will stay on exhibit as long as we think that, as long as the Afghans think that the message is important to be told. Has anything been broken? <laughs> the question, has anything been broken? Uh, nothing that isn't fixable, nothing that isn't, uh, you know, we, we work with the very best conservators in the world on this.
Um, when you are speaking about the Afghans, um, I assume you're talking about the Afghan archaeological community, but what, um, what is the popular understanding of archaeology in Afghanistan and about these kinds of finds? And what was that understanding before the reopening of these and, and these crates? And, and has that changed? What does the average Afghan know about this archaeological situation? Uh, thank you for that question. It's a question about what does the average Afghan think about the cultural heritage of Afghanistan. Uh, for those people who have had the blessing of having an education in Afghanistan, which is a very small, unfortunately small percentage, the reopening of the museum crates has been a blessing beyond what you can imagine. If you can imagine having your culture basically dispersed around the world and then all of a sudden told, no, it's not lost or stolen or destroyed, it exists. It's as if, you know, somebody who had died was alive, right? But we have a huge educational issue in Afghanistan because during 25 years of war and civil war and chaos, educational systems break down and people who live in Herat or Kandahar or Bamiyan, they might not be aware of this. So we have a huge job in terms of re-educating people about, you know, how they should be stewards of their country and how they should be proud of where they live. So it's a challenge. Has this helped prompt any new or renewed digs on site in Afghanistan? The question is, has this um, prompted new uh, excavations in Afghanistan? Ironically, our mission, our, uh, the, the group of people I work with through National Geographic and through the Ministry of Culture of Afghanistan, we do not promote new excavations because at the moment what our focus is on is on education and site preservation. That's what we want to do. Just uh, make sure that, that people maintain these sites. There are a few new excavations, but uh, uh, that's not the priority right now. What has happened to the big site that you showed us that was ransacked with all the loopholes? <sighs> so the question is, uh, what, what is the status of the site that I showed you before and after? That's the site of Ikhanum. It's a Greek site. Um, it's it's, you know, uh, a historic monument now as uh, a site with a lot of looters holes. Um, there's not much there. I suppose the, the good news behind that is that uh, Afghanistan is one of the archaeologically most rich countries in the world. More than 1,500 known archaeological sites. Uh, Alexander the Great founded eight cities in Afghanistan. Uh, that one was just one. So we hope in the future when it's calm, when I'm sort of in my wheelchair, I will be able to go back and, and dig in Afghanistan. It'll be great. Uh, with your permission, may I add some, something to your lecture? Uh, uh, in 19, late 1970s, there were Begram ivories, uh, some of those beautiful ones, uh, across the border and came to Pakistan, they were on sale between the Samabah and the other cities. And uh, what happened that we all decided, I was a there at the time, decided that we should buy it and keep it, you see, in trust until the museum is established and you see the situation goes phenomenal and it is given to them. And a number of countries contributed to the aid to the collection of it. And that was the policy which was officially adopted in Pakistan in order to save some of the things which had received from the government. So this is, I hope someday, those were also those that did reconstructions of those costumes, one by Sadi Nidhi and one by another Russian. What's the basis for these contrasting reconstructions? So uh, Professor Hammond asked, what, why are there different reconstructions for the uh, various garbs? Uh, a wonderful question. Um, I have a textile expert in um, in Holland who has completely different reconstruction as well. I think it's one of the wonderful things about about relooking at artifacts. Imagine these tilatape, these Bactrian gold artifacts, not to mention the Bagram and the Ikhanum and 
the whole slew were last seen in the 19, early 1980s. For scholars, that mainly that basically means they're sort of you know out of sight, out of mind, right? There's been very little study of these artifacts. Now that we have these artifacts to see again, now that one could theoretically go to Pablo and study them, or one can go to the Met and see the objects. Now we're, we're, the debate about these objects are coming up again, and we're seeing that the debate about how they were reconstructed or what they mean is very lively indeed. And yes, uh, it, it's a, a pleasure to me to see that we not only have one reconstruction of them, we have three. So I couldn't think of anything being more interesting for the field of archaeology and the field of history. Thank you for that question. The, the question is, does the current exhibition include any Islamic artifacts? That is a sad story, I have to tell you. That when the Kabul Museum was bombed in 1993, the only collection that, that had the wrath of the bombing was the Islamic collection. And it was a wonderful, wonderful collection of bronzes and ceramics, uh, that document perhaps one of the great centers of the intellectual world in medieval times, Ghazni and uh, this, and those treasures are gone. And so we don't have any Islamic treasures to put on display. So it was purposely, uh, well, I mean, it was the reality of the museum collections that we don't have Islamic materials for in the exhibition. Has any of the human remains of any of the six burials uh, been recovered or analyzed back in the in the early 80s or late 70s? Or yeah, so the, the, the question is, so were any of the human remains from the six burials, six marvelous, mysterious burials uh, analyzed? Uh, unfortunately, the, um, the the bones were, were stored in a different institute in uh, Afghanistan, one that was also destroyed during the war, and we, we don't have any, uh, there are maybe some small fragments, but uh, they're coded in, in deep storage, and so we don't have any analysis on this. Okay. Yeah. So, our last question, and then we can... The only museum in Kabul and Afghanistan, were there any other museums before the war, before the Soviet invasion? The, the question is, were there other museums? Yes, in fact, I, um, I'm happy to say that there were other um, museums. Well, happy, I suppose that's the wrong term. Um, there, there were other museums. My favorite museum in Afghanistan was the Open Air Museum in Hada, in Jalalabad, in Afghanistan in what is today the heart of the combat area. And it was really a, a magnificent museum. It was a, a Buddhist uh, city with all sort of life-size life sculpture and beautiful images, even a wonderful stucco image of Alexander the Great himself. And those finds, they've all been destroyed. And, and uh, we're happy that the Kabul Museum collections uh, in the center of the city were safe, but most of the regional museums were, were destroyed and looted. <clears throat> Thank you. Shall we continue back? Thank you. Thank you.